Hello friends, and welcome back to a Dungeon Design in Zelda. Last time, we finished off the Palace of Darkness and have been set loose into the Dark World. Now, from here, there is a bit of flexibility in terms of dungeon order, but for the sake of this series, we'll be completing these Dark World dungeons in the game's intended order, that being the order in which these crystals are literally numbered on the map. As such, the Swamp Palace is next, but as usual, there's a few pre-dungeon things to talk about first. Since obtaining the hammer in the Palace of Darkness, a fair amount of the Dark World is open to us now. Between that and the mirror giving us the ability to travel between worlds more freely, suddenly there's a ton of secrets we can get, which is awesome. I recommend going out of the way to get the flute in particular, since that will work as the game's fast travel. I mentioned in a previous video how the game was using dungeon items to break up the progression through the overworld before, and that feeling is just as alive here as well. The Swamp Palace is our next destination, and with the hammer we can either knock down these pegs blocking this little bridge in the dark world, as well as uncover this portal in the Swamp Palace area of the light world. So in a way, simply by exploring around and looking for new places to use our newly acquired item, we're being subtly guided towards the next dungeon. Although we can head into the dungeon right away, there isn't anything we can actually do in there past the foyer until we solve this little puzzle. In short, the two worlds affect each other, so in order to get into the depths of the dungeon in the dark world, we need to drain the water in the swamp of the light world. Clever stuff. Once we've done that though, we can head into the dungeon. Welcome to the Swamp Palace, a particularly noteworthy dungeon as it plays with a lot of notorious Zelda concepts. In many ways, this dungeon feels like a 2D equivalent or proto version of the Water Temple that would take shape in Ocarina of Time. Not just because it has a strong water theme though, many of the puzzles and traversal mechanics revolve around changing the water level in the dungeon, and of course, the dungeon item is the Hookshot. The first ever hookshot in the series, in fact. God, I love this thing. What justification do I need? It's the hookshot. Now, I'm sure there are people who heard me say changing water levels and were immediately turned off of this dungeon, but let me assure you that the Swamp Palace is not nearly as confusing as many of the series' more notorious water themed dungeons. In fact, I think the way the progression is structured in this dungeon is incredibly intuitive. The Swamp Palace features a large, memorable central room that the rest of the dungeon branches off of, meaning you always have one strong focal point to return to when exploring. Different sections of the dungeon are blocked off or inaccessible until certain conditions are met, and the big chest with the dungeon item rests at the heart of all of this, teasing you yet again. Before that, though, there's a string of rooms from the foyer leading into this central room that ease you into the dungeon mechanics really nicely. First is the spot where we find the map behind a very obvious bombable wall on this balcony. We can see some explorable space beyond, and if we miss the map and end up in those sections later, we can spot that treasure chest that we passed by. So its placement is really a failsafe in a way. Then we get our first water level puzzle, initially needing us to explore to find this key, to unlock this door, to raise the water so that we can swim over to the next section. Spelled out like that, this sounds really easy and obvious, but in practice you have to stop think and explore, and the game makes you feel really smart when it all falls into place. The central room is next, and as I mentioned before, it will be vital to how we explore here. Excluding the door we came through, and this little secret balcony area, there's four doors here, but here's how the dungeon smartly guides you. For one thing, the northern door is entirely out of reach and locked. The northwest door is locked as well, so with a little 
process of elimination, we only have two doors to choose from, and you can do these in either order. Consulting our recently acquired dungeon map will also show us that the door to the south leads us to a much smaller section than the southwest door. So for me, that's a logical starting point, which gives us the compass. So then it's off to that remaining western door. This path is something of a repeat of that previous water level puzzle, but made slightly more complicated by the inclusion of a gem switch corresponding to the red and blue barriers. Ultimately, our goal in this section is to get the big key, but both the lever to change the water as well as the door to the big key are obstructed by these switch blocks, so you have to alter both the water level and alternate the colored switches. To top the puzzle off, we have to get onto these ledges by jumping down from the floor above. These gem switches and elevation-based puzzles were both introduced to us back in the Tower of Hera, so they are mechanics that should be more than familiar to us by now. But it's cool to see the game introduce these three separate mechanics and then combine them into one puzzle like this. Again, even if it's rather intuitive to figure out, the game does such a good job of making you feel so smart when you do. As I mentioned before, the payoff here is the big key. And here's another strength of the dungeon, anticipation. See, we've been weaving in and out of the central room while exploring the dungeon, which means that we keep passing by this big treasure chest. It's been sitting there within reach, but unopenable. Again, teasing us. So after completing a complicated puzzle and getting the big key, I get a real sense of giddiness at the prospect of finally being able to open that chest up. You're made to backtrack through this section with some shortcuts, of course, and the whole time that I'm doing so, I'm just filled with excitement about being able to get that dungeon item. And again, why wouldn't I be? It's the freaking hook shot. With the item in hand, we can now reach that northern door, but it is locked, so we have to find the key first, which is hidden under this skull on this ledge. I love that this room makes you use the hook shot to get that hidden key and then reach the door. There's only three ledges here that are newly opened up to us at this moment, but when I'm playing the game, it feels like this room was designed to be a little hook shot playground to get us acquainted with our new item, and I love that. It's just fun to use this thing. The final section of the dungeon is the path towards the boss fight. Most of this game's dungeons so far have relegated this section into a linear combat gauntlet, ramping up the tension before the boss. Here, however, the puzzle-centric navigational challenge doesn't go away. It's not that the path isn't linear per se, but there are still branching paths paths and multiple routes into certain rooms, meaning you have to carefully consider which path to take to actually make progress. You may take a wrong staircase and be unable to move forward, meaning you have to backtrack, figure out how to change the water level, and then move forward from there. It's clever stuff. I also kind of enjoy that this part of the path is hidden behind this waterfall. Stuff behind waterfalls is always a fun concept, but it's not too obscure since you can head into this adjacent room and see that there is a hidden path connecting to the next room over. You just have to figure out how to get there. Regardless, I love how twisting and winding these narrow corridors are. Some of these rooms feel quite claustrophobic, but there's so many little goodies and secrets to uncover, which makes it genuinely rewarding to explore through here. Once we've successfully navigated these damp, dank corridors, we can finally confront the dungeon boss. Entering the boss room will be confronted by Argus. Yep, big eyeball. And if you're thinking, isn't this that mid-boss from Great Bay Temple called Wart? Well, yes it is. Though this game came first, so really Wart is this guy. Semantics aside, Argus is a fine boss. He's not extraordinary by any means, but he is perfect. 
perfectly serviceable. I love how he looks though. He is just a big ugly monster in the best way. Initially, he will form a protective barrier around himself using these rocks, which we can use the hookshot to yank away. Continuing the trend of dungeon item integration in the boss battle, like we saw with the Helmsor King. Even though apparently I was the only person on earth who didn't know that you can use bombs in that fight. Oops. Though, if we want to compare this guy to his Majora's Mask counterpart, I do think that game did a slightly better job in terms of giving you a variety of options to use in combat while stripping away his defenses. Here, we can't just break apart those rocks using the sword. We've got to hookshot them individually to yank them away from the cluster and destroy them. This mechanic, though a little slow in 2D like this, is not intrusive. This is not a bad fight by any means, and there is a real satisfaction to seeing those numbers dwindle before leaving him defenseless. In some boss fights, it really feels like we as the player have to be on the defense and carefully wait for our moments to strike. Here, it really feels like the best thing to do is be aggressive. We are on the offense here, and it's up to us to break apart our opponent's defense and then strike him down. Argus has a second phase as well. Once we've removed all those defenses, he'll suddenly start hopping and charging around the room, which in a way almost feels like him panicking. He's not even necessarily aiming for us, he's just getting desperate. It's neat to see, but maybe that's just my interpretation of his erratic movements here. At this point though, it's just a matter of attacking him and not taking too many hits yourself. It's good stuff. Once he's defeated, we'll get our heart container as usual, the maiden is freed, and we're off to continue exploring the dark world. So that's the dungeon. If someone sat me down and asked me to design my ideal 2D Zelda dungeon, it would probably be pretty close to this. From start to finish, this dungeon is challenging you, while remaining intuitive. The first section introduces the new mechanics of the dungeon to you, and then the rest of the dungeon remixes and builds upon those mechanics while combining them with puzzle ideas that we saw in previous dungeons. That sort of thing is brilliant. It's not without its flaws though, so I'll air out some of my gripes and praises here. I appreciate how well the dungeon balances its enemy placement and navigational puzzles for the most part. I think most times it's done pretty well, where the more puzzle-centric rooms aren't quite as brimming with baddies, and the more combat-heavy rooms require a little less brain power to get through. I like that. It feels nicely balanced. But there are some times where it just feels inevitable that you're going to have to just tank some hits because enemies are cluttering at ramps, ladders, or stairs. Nine times out of ten, it is not an issue. But it's irritating when it does come up. Like, why can't I kill these guys? Even trying to bait them away from the ladder here, I'd still end up taking some damage. And it's not like I can fight them while swimming, either. I also think some of these rooms could be slightly more visually distinct from each other. For the most part, it's not an issue, but there's a couple of instances that seem like they just reused a room, and I can see the navigation getting confusing for new players because of it. I also would have loved to have had a little more use for the hookshot in terms of traversal. I love that the final section of the dungeon requires it to be accessed in the first place, but I feel like there's some opportunity to have taken it farther after this point. Hey, maybe have a little platform over here in this room that we could hookshot to and avoid having to swim and take damage from these little buggers? Uh, just a thought. There's also a few instances of very obvious keys being found in the same room as the locked door that we need it for. I personally would rather these be spread out a bit more to incentivize that more thorough exploration. Because if I'm being honest, finding this key right here to unlock this door right here, like a meter away, just feels kind of 
pointless to me. It's not the biggest deal in the end though, and all of these gripes are fairly harmless. So I think it speaks to the quality of this dungeon overall that my complaints feel so nitpicky. Overall, this dungeon does a lot of things really brilliantly. Those intuitive but still challenging puzzles are a joy for me. There's so many little nooks and crannies to explore and find loots and secrets, which is always fun for me. Seriously, so many of these spots and treasures in that final section are totally optional, but I love discovering them. I also love that just entering the dungeon actually makes use of the game's dual world system, and that feeling of anticipation and satisfaction with elements such as the dungeon item are implemented in an extremely effective way. The fact that I've played this game so many times and still get giddy when I find that big key and can go get the hookshot is pretty impressive. I love that this room feels like a little hookshot playground getting us acquainted with our new item, and the fact that the boss fight puts it to use so well is a lovely bonus. While later games would take many of these concepts and run with them in even better ways, it's awesome to see these mechanics not just have their roots here, but also be so well designed on their first go. If you couldn't tell, I like this dungeon a lot. Thank you all so much for watching. Before we end this off, I just wanted to say thank you to the lovely people who supported me on Patreon or here on YouTube as a channel member, including, but not limited to, Grey Mage, Brenda, Tetra, Callie, Hylian Wes, Justin, Midnight, Naomi, and Bunny. Thank you all so much for the support and for watching, and I will catch you all next time. Bye bye <laughs>